survey that was done in our own country. We always say we don't have our own country data, but we do. And 60% of major gynecological surgeries are actually hysterectomy. The commonest symptom is uh, fibro reason is fibroid uterus. And this data does not include large uterus, but includes all uteruses. So why have this discussion? Now, large uterus hysterectomy is not unusual in a referral center. However, it may be not that common in a common gynecological practice. Uh, there is a group from Italy, and I'll be discussing one or two papers from them called uh, uh, Stefano Yusela. They actually had an incidence of 5.7% of their hysterectomies where the uteri was more than 1 kg. We analyzed our own data, and we have also published. We'll go through that. We have about 18.7% of our patients who are larger than 16 weeks. And we did a clinical assessment because that's important for us to do a pre-operatively assessment as to what the size of uterus is rather than tell post-operatively what the weight of the uterus was. And the root of hysterectomy, Cochrane data always says, if you can do vaginal, you are great, don't use anything else. But usual approach to large uterus world over is abdominal. And there is no clear guideline as to what is the size that you should approach by minimal access surgery. So when we talk about large uterus and minimal access surgery, you know, what are the difficulties? It fills the pelvis obstructing the view. We saw that video in the morning. Difficulty to reach the pedicles, difficult to mobilize and manipulate, and of course, it obscures surrounding anatomical structure, so you have a danger of adjacent organ damage. So two technical challenges. There is an inability to complete, so we convert, and there is problem in retrieving that large specimen. How do we do that? And in achieving this, these two technical problems, the concern remains that we'll have hemorrhage and we may damage the organs around. So first, I'll take you through a paper from the same group from University of Insubaya in Italy. Now, comparison of laparoscopic hysterectomy is open. Now, that's the first comparison we need to do to understand whether minimal access should be done or not. There are a total of 258 patients. The literature usually recommends that do not use for more than 15 weeks or more than 500. But this group has actually published a paper with all you try more than 1 kg. Now, what are their results? Now, if you see their Previous surgery, now this was what was I was discussing in the morning as well, is the previous surgery with either caesarean section or abdominal surgery adds to your problem. So that is the first thing that they discussed and they had almost, if you see, about 50-55% about of patients had this problem in, the, in this case series as well. The next, if you want to, want to notice, is actually the size of the uterus. Open hysterectomy definitely had larger uh, size of uterus. The operative time was, however, smaller. And if you notice the complications, the overall complications, if you see six patients out of 55 had complications as compared to the uh, complications of about only nine out of 203. Both groups had similar numbers of complications and abdominal group had overall higher number. Now, if you look also at their multivariate analysis because they did, then did try to understand what was the single factor that reduced the complication in the laparoscopic group. And they came to a conclusion that the laparoscopic approach itself was the biggest factor that reduced their complication. So this paper initially now lays the ground that yes, large uteri should be attempted laparoscopically or now robotically where complication rates will be less. So minimal invasive surgery is stay. All advantages of minimum, I don't need to tell, but reduction in overall complications in these women in this particular. A meta-analysis comparing TLH with TH also had similar outcomes and similar observations. It's an interesting survey done by a previous AIGL president, Dr. Anarson, and he wanted to survey the OBS and gynae people themselves what they would prefer. Now, they said that 40% of themselves that they, they wanted to, they had to have a hysterectomy for large uterus, they'll go for minimal access. And 50% said that they will go for their spouses as well. But they also in that survey said that they have difficulty in doing these surgeries because of limited training, technical difficulties, lots of personal experience, and of course, longer operating. These were the barriers for themselves performing, but they would like to do that. So this is a very interesting survey and very interesting fact that, so hysterectomy by root, over the years have definitely, the laparoscopic part has increased. However, it has not reached 100% of all these patients. Now, we published our own experience or our own data of large series of patients whom we did a laparoscopic hysterectomy for large uteri. We did a clinical assessment and selected these patients for more than 16 weeks of pregnancy, and we described our techniques and feasibility in performing and, of course, our outcome in these patients. This was published just a month back. Now, if you see 
we again had a large number of patients, almost about 44-45% of patients who had previous caesarean sections and previous laparotomies, which adds to your problem. And these patients, if you see the number of ports that we used, we had an average number of ports of just three. That means one, lap one, one uh, laparoscope and two side ports. But uh, uh, an equal number of ports, we had to actually also put one contralateral port, which I try and avoid in my cases because I'm a short person and I can't go across the patient. I try to operate most of the but, but in large uterus, you have to go contralateral to reach that side of pedicle and especially the uterines. The average drop in hemoglobin in our series was about 1.76 gram percent. And if you, we also did a multivariate analysis to understand what were the reasons for us to give a suprapubic incision in these, in our series, which was about 10.9 percent in that. This conversion we found that correlated with drop in hemoglobin and of course an organ injury. So these were two factors which stood out in our multivariate analysis which made us do the conversion at the end of the procedure in a laparoscopic hysterectomy. But they did not significantly uh, 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 correlate significantly with conversion like inability to complete or difficult bladder dissection or presence of adhesions or obesity or of presence of comorbidity. So they did not, were not logistically responsible for our conversions but presence of um, uh, hemoglo uh, hemorrhage and bladder injury was. We also analyzed over the years what happened. Now we, this is one thing which I would like the juniors to understand that there's a learning curve for everything. We found that in our own series from 2011 to 16, there was a learning curve. If you see the number of actually suprapubic, the red mark or so-called conversions were actually in the first three years. And we learned our tricks and we did not need to do that later. So this is something which we need to learn in any minimal access surgery. Post-operative characteristics, we did the clavin dendro system and we found that these were some of our uh, complications in the post-op period. Some of the techniques which we evolved in minimal access surgery and now I replicate that in my robotic surgeries as well is to do an intraoperative myomectomy. I haven't done that for my robotic surgeries but we could try in some of them. Use a 30 degree scope, I use of always in my robotic surgery as well and use skillfully rotating. Now the assistant used to rotate in the laparoscopy and I rotate now myself with a console. Effectively manipulate the uterus with either a manipulator or a myoma screw. I, in, in my uh, laparoscopic surgery, I don't use a carpenterizer. I generally open my vault and do it like an abdominal surgery, but in robotic we are using, so that's the difference. And keep the port placement simple, use minimal instruments. This is a met, uh, literature overall review of the patients. And if you see the complication rates, again, overall in the literature also is about 11%. And this is the total complication rates in the same. Coming to the actual talk that we wanted to discuss, a retrospective analysis between the robotic and the laparoscopic group in our own center, we assessed the outcome of minimally invasive surgery for large uter. Again, our cutoff was more than 16 weeks, and we compared what could be. This was a retrospective analysis over five years, and most of them in the robotic group, actually if you, the bias here is, the robotic has my learning curve and the laparoscopy probably does not. So that is a little bias here, but anyway, we did compare our outcomes. There was 165 women, 46 underwent robotic, and 111 we selected for this group for laparoscopic hysterectomy. 11 women at this, in this group underwent open, we excluded them from our studies, collected all these data, and we collected the operating time. Now when we collected the operating time, we actually collected for uh, in the robotic cases or in the laparoscopic cases, three methods. One was skin to skin, the other was the actual time for done hysterectomy. Now this was usually recorded by our recorded time. That is as the console time that was recorded or the laparoscopic time that was this time that the surgeon actually needed to complete the surgery. And then there was an OT2 time which actually included port placement, docking, morselation, and most of these wards were closed vaginally. So that part, that, that two, five minutes also is included in that time. The results were mean age, BMI was significantly higher in our robotic group. The presentations were similar. There was really nothing to say, but most common indication was, of course, fibroid in these patients. There was no difference between the two groups in terms of what was previous uh, surgery in these patients. The mean size of uterus was higher in robotic, but it was not clinically significant as far as statistics is concerned. Number of ports were higher because in all robotic patients, we had four ports because we had two robotic ports, one camera and one assistant. In laparoscopy, in 50%, we managed with only three. The number of patients requiring adizolysis were higher. This also indicates that we are probably picking up more tough cases for robotics because simple cases we try to finish laparoscopically. Intraoperative myomectomy, this technique I have not done yet in robotics. 
I may do it. I will share that experience sometime later if I do it. Difficult bladder dissections were more in robotic surgeries, probably again, reflection of the fact that they were typically, and vaginal morselation was similar in both the situations. And all the organ injuries actually that I had were in laparoscopic, probably a reflection of right, more number of cases or my learning curve or whatever it was. So operative time, if you see between the three groups, actually they're all significantly higher in robotic. And this is what I said is because Unfortunately, when I, not in this group, but when I speak in any other group, the first thing I get audience response is robotic takes too much time. But if you see, the actual extra time is in this group, the OT2 time. That is the extra port placement, docking and all that. The overall, though it is a significant difference in statistically, it is not really too much of difference. Average is just a difference of five minutes, which actually does not matter in the long run. The OT time is significant, and that could be a reflection of so many things, the, the case that you were doing, the other ancillary factors. So we have not really evaluated. It's difficult to de-individualize each case unless you really do a randomized control trial and keep both case groups very similar, which is not possible. When we analyzed about blood loss, robotic hysterectomy was associated with lower drop in hemoglobin as compared to laparoscopic hysterectomy. And uh, multiple ana uh, regressor analysis, we actually saw, tried to see what were the factors that were responsible once we corrected them regarding the hemoglobin drop. So we found that this difference remained significant even when we controlled the size, the BMI of the patient, the history of previous abdominal surgery, and injury to concrete organ. So if we controlled all these factors, still we found that in robotic surgery, we had significantly less blood loss. And I think that is a very, very important factor in us understanding, rather than trying to say, the post-operative stay and all those things. Because in India, I don't think it matters. The patient goes in one day, most often you are ready to send the patient one day, say I stay another day. So I think that is not the factor. The factor is that if you actually really significantly reduce the blood loss, you can actually reduce the blood uh, components that the patient requires. Post-operative stay, as I said, was similar. The requirement of analgesia was a little better in robotic group. Conversion rate to open surgery was 4.3 in robotic and 10.9. Now this is not statically significant if you have to see, because the numbers were different in the two groups. But I would still say that we actually needed, out of 43, we actually needed to convert only in two patients. So in our laparoscopic hysterectomy series, we converted in 14 cases. Six were converted because of intraoperative hemorrhage, five because of difficulty to reach the pedicles. And as I showed you, they were all in my early, early learning curve. So learning curve matters. And even the Stephen Osella group, as well as our group, we can say that there is no shortcut to learning how to do difficult surgery. The learning curve has to be respected and learned right from simple cases to difficult ones. So a higher BMI need for more adesylases and greater number of women with difficult in the robotic hysterectomy group possibly imply that there were more challenging cases. Robotic hysterectomy was definitely associated with definite less blood loss and conversion rates, and it's feasible. And of course, with this experience, I can say it's safe if done with proper experience. This is a small clip of a patient I thought I will share. Uh, this was again clinically the same size of uterus that I showed you in the morning, 24, 26 week size uterus. But the, but the be benefit here was, this, uh, even in the lower uterine segment, it was not involving the cervix. Now when you have a large uterus like that, the pedicles are all easily accessible. You actually don't need to put your umbilical, the primary uh, port also above the umbilical. I was doing that earlier. But then I learned the method that I can put it at umbilicus because I need to reach my round ligament, I need to reach my pedicles, and it's like a reverse hysterectomy. The rest of the uterine mass is above in the pelvis, I don't need to reach there because I need to reach the pelvis. So this is a uterus, you can see a large fibroid from the lower uterine segment, but I am reaching my pedicles quite simply by placing my primary port at the umbilicus. This is not higher up. I used to put higher up when I started doing because I used to, uh, we were taught with robotics 10 centimeter from the target organ. So if the uterus is 24, where are you going to go? If it's sternum, it used to be very tough. But then I realized that probably with a large multiple fibroids, the ligaments that you need to approach are lower down. You don't need to really go that high up. So this is one patient. And this patient, we actually had to do an umbilical um, morselation because there was just no space in the vagina. So laparoscopic hysterectomy with or without robot, Stanford experience. Now, I, I'm sure you will recognize this gentleman, this Karma Nezat. I almost always never finish my, and I had a pleasure of just meeting him 15 days back at a conference in Perugia in Italy. 
I was just discussing for him, and, and I was asking because he, I think anybody who knows or, or looks into minimal access surgery articles will definitely always come across Dr. Karma Nezat, and he's a wizard with laparoscopy. He was the, probably the pioneer person who started the video laparoscopy. And he told me, Ruma, I firmly believe that we are going to have a cross path between the laparoscopy and the robotic. And the robotic is going to find a place here. It is definitely feasible for large uterus or for anything with additional, no additional morbidity. The length of stay, hospital stay is comparable, but BMI uterine size did not limit our ability to do this. So if you compare robotic hysterectomy to other minimally embracing uh, approach, there's another paper, which again, similar findings as what we have been trying to discuss. This is a, another paper which discusses uh, total hysterectomy with adhesions and large uterus is the kind of surgery we were, we were trying to do. And severe adhesions actually, in fact, this is an interesting paper which comes to the conclusion that independent of the adhesion score and uterine weight, actually robotic surgery got completed faster. And I'd like to comment this with what Dr. Rama was trying to show. I think it is much easier to do that bowel and omental dissection when your abdomen is inflated rather than in an open situation. So when your bowel, anyway, things are retracted. So I think if you know the planes, you can dissect them much better. I find it much easier than doing laparoscopically or robotically than when I have to open. If I'm open, I'm lost. Where is my bowel and where is what? So factors that determine a su successful completion is, of course, careful selection. This is most important. Previous abdominal surgeries can take you in all kinds of path, and it depends upon whatever way you're comfortable with. Effective surgical steps is understand where to do trocar placement, if you need, put an extra trocar. Primary port above umbilicus was taught, but I have learned now that probably is not essential. You need to assess and variations in tackling the uterine arteries. So I think I'll come to an end.